morning. This is uh, Antioch Missionary Baptist Church with the Reach Out uh, Mission. And it's Sunday, February the 21st. And uh, it seems like to me these weeks are just clipping by really quick. If you have your Bibles, look with me in Acts chapter 12. And we're going to start in verse 17. Acts 12, 17. And this is talking about when Peter was locked up and you remember how all the people got together and they prayed for his release. And God released him. Got him out of prison. And uh, that's where we're picking up. But he beckoned them unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declaring unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go and show these things unto James and the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. And as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. Uh, they had him locked up, chained and everything. Now they can't find him. What, what has become of him? Where did he go? How did he get out of here? And so it says in verse 19, And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and the commanders and that they should be put to death. And then he went down to Judea, to Caesarea, to abode there. So because he had escaped, because of the prayer of the uh, Christians, King Herod had all the, the jailers in what put to death. And uh, hold your place here, but let's go over in Acts 16. And we're going to start in 26. And this is another example of another man. This is Paul when he was put in prison. And it says here, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. So, you know, what happened in Peter's time until now, what's happening in Paul's time, no doubt this jailer, he, he definitely figured, well, I'm going to be put to death just like what happened in Peter's time. So he drew out his sword and was going to kill himself, and then in verse 28, it says, But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in, and there came trembling and fell down before a Paul and Silas. So he thought they had fled, but then Paul called out to him, Don't harm yourself. We're, we're still here. And so he came in and he fell down before them. And it says in verse 30, And he brought them out and to the said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the words of the Lord, and to all them that were in the house, and he took them that same hour of night and washed their stripes and baptized he and all of his straight way. And when he had brought them into his hell, his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his household. So what happened and transpired in just a very little time was from the point that he was ready to take his own life, and now he's taking them home. He washed their stripes where they had been whipped, and he gave them food to eat, and they witnessed to him, and he is now a child of God. Isn't that remarkable? What 
what at one point he was fixing to kill himself till now he's and his whole household are now saved. Boy, that, that's a glorious story right there, in my opinion. And if you will, back over in Acts chapter 12, We're going to start in verse 20. And Herod was highly displeased with them and Tyra and Siron. And he came with one accord to him and have made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desiring peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. It's like kind of like what America does to a lot of countries today. We help them out. We send them food. Uh, and this is a good thing, but I also think we need to take care of the Americans that are needing food and shelter before we can be just helping everybody. But he says here that uh, the king, uh, they Blastus was uh, glad that Herod had helped out his country because they relied on his uh, good generosity in order to get by. Now, in verse 21, And upon a set day, Herod arrayed a royal apparel, and sat upon his throne, and made an orientation unto them. Now, an orientation is a, in this way, it, that he presented it was a vain ambition. You know, King Herod, all of the King Herods, there were several of them. <laughs> None of them were very good. They weren't any good at all. And to have this type of vain ambition kind of makes me think of what the word egotistical means. And that means it's someone that is express, expressively Conceited, they're very conceited. They absorb in oneself, and they are self-centered. A person that doesn't look out for others, it's all about me. And that's how King Herod was here. And so, here in verse 22, And the people gave a shout saying, this is the voice of a God and not of a man. Uh, they're wrong. <laughs> King Herod was a far part from being any kind of a God because he was a, a very bad king. But they looked at him as a God. If you will look with me in uh, Acts 28, and we're going to start in verse 3. And it says, and when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid on the fire, they came a viper out of the heat and fastened onto his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hanging on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast and the fire, and he felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said, He is a God. Well, Paul isn't a God either, but God was with him because this venomous uh, snake had bitten him and it should have at least swollen uh, or maybe fall down dead, none of the side effects from the venom did anything to him. You know, it's remarkable how God is and uh, it's that a lot of times certain things happen in our lives or we hear on TV that this should have happened to this person, but it didn't. Why? Because God intervened for them. 
He intervenes for us every day, whether we know it or not, in uh, helping us in the decisions that we make and what we do and what we say, if we will let him do so. And that's the point. Some of us are not too willing to allow him to intervene in our life. But if you're willing to, he'll watch over and take care of you in ways beyond our means, beyond our understanding. Now back over in Acts chapter 12, and we're going to pick up in verse 23. And said, you know, they said, this he was a God. They said, Paul was a God. Now back over here, they're saying that uh, Herod is a God. And look what happened. Because he was a, not of even a Christian. It says, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because gave not God the glory. See, he absorbed it in them calling him a God, and he didn't give God the glory for it. He accepted it. Well, I'm like a God. And so the angel came and immediately smote him because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms, and he gave up the ghost immediately. Didn't happen next day. Didn't happen next week. Immediately, right then and there, he was consumed with worms and eaten, and he gave up the ghost. That's pretty powerful, too, isn't it? <laughs> it says, but the word of God grew and multiplied. God's word is always presented out there that it can grow and it can be multiplied and spread to other people. If you will look with me over in, uh, Ro in uh, Revelations, Chapter 14, and we're going to read in verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The gospel that we preach today isn't just here today and gone tomorrow. It's everlasting. The gospel that we preach Today is the gospel that our forefathers preached. You know, I often think about where would we be if our forefathers had not presented the gospel and handed it down from generation to generation? I don't know. <laughs> I'm thankful they did, though. I'm very thankful for my parents and grandparents that they believed in the Lord and they saw that I heard about the Lord. And I'm thankful for Amanda and Nathan uh, telling uh, and bringing Dilton to church that he may grow up knowing about the Lord and trusting in him uh, as his Savior. It's, it's very important. It's very, very important. There are a lot of children that are the age of Dilton that's never been inside a church at all. And that's sad. That's sad. If you will back in, uh, he said here that he saw the uh, verse 6, and we're in Revelation 14, 6, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwelled on the earth and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. He didn't leave out anybody. God wants the gospel to be preached to every nation, every kindred. Doesn't matter what color you are. Doesn't matter what language you speak. He wants the gospel to be preached to all that they might know him as their savior. And I've said this not too long ago. Isn't it remarkable? I, for one, can only speak English. I know a little bit of Spanish, but not enough to really stand up and preach a sermon in Spanish uh, to anyone. But God knows every language that's on this earth. He knows them all. So even if you are say a prayer to God in Chinese, he knows what you said. If you say it in English, he knows what you said. If you say it in Italian, he knows what you said. 
Doesn't matter what language you speak, God understands all languages of all nations and of all people. That's remarkable in itself. Back over in Acts chapter 12, and we're going to pick up in verse uh, 20, uh, I mean uh, 25. Well, before we go there, let's read one more verse over here in Isaiah 55, starting in verse 10. He says, As for the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not hither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth the bud, that they may have seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Now, we've had a little snow problem this last week, but all that snow as it melts, where is it going to go? It's going to sink down into the earth, just like a rain would do. And it's going to cause, in the springtime, for the leaves to come back on the trees, for the beautiful flowers that we have come back up, and farmers can plant their wheat, corn, or whatever they're planting, and it's going to cause it to grow. It may just be your little garden at home where you plant many varieties of vegetables. But watering and the sunshine is what makes it grow. And now in verse uh, 11, So shall my word be that soweth, goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing wherein I do send it. So just like the earth gets watered, when I preach a sermon to people, God's going to put it or water it where it needs to be watered, and God's word will never return void. It has its purpose. It has its meaning. And I thank God that anything you say or do in the name of the Lord Jesus or even quote a scripture to someone it don't return void. If you will, back in uh, Acts chapter 12. Verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So all of the things that happened with Paul being bit on the hand, and, you know, he has a, an incredible amount of stories. He wrote 13 books of the Bible. Paul did. None of that returns void. If you know the Lord, you love the Lord, and you trust in the Lord. I hope that this Sunday you get something that you can carry with you this week. And not just this week, but for the rest of your life, realizing that God's word never returns void. It accomplishes its purpose. And what is God's main purpose? To tell us about his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, to take away our sins, that if we believe in him, we shall have everlasting life. I thank the Lord that I know the Lord as my personal Savior. I thank you, and may God bless you, and I hope this next week is a very good week for each and every one of you. God bless you. Thank you.